Welcome to the United States of America podcast. I am your host, Neethi Bali, and we are broadcasting live from the Food Church here on North Carolina. We welcome you to make yourself comfortable as we go over the current state of the world and our nation. If you've missed past episodes, please be sure to take time to at least watch the first episode to have a proper introduction to our conversations. These conversations are not otherwise happening in any sequential order. Please be aware that we expect you to behave with honor in our comment section. We are a people at peace and we have declared peace to all nations around the world. This is not a marketing or sales podcast and we are not sovereign citizens. Sovereign citizen is an oxymoron. And if you say that you are a sovereign citizen, you are a moron. A sovereign is a free an honorable living man or woman who operates under God's law, under natural law, and who honors themselves and others in peace. One definition for the word citizen is slave, but there are different kinds of citizens. But when you put those two words together, that's an oxymoron. We also do not promote or condone TikTok, Facebook, or any other social media games to test the system or to impose your beliefs onto society at large. This is not a marketing or promotional channel. We're not selling anything. We're not making any money here. We are shining a light on truth that is being hidden from you. We are sharing the truth about your birthright and your inheritance. We are interested in helping you reclaim your birthright and your inheritance. We are not sitting in judgment of you. And this information is simply a beacon of light for you to use when you choose to seek it. We do have marshals at arms that are designated as moderators who are assisting in the comment section. Please be kind with your words. If you diminish others, you will be put in a timeout or deleted and blocked as deemed necessary. If you have questions, please put them in all caps and only enter them once per show. Um, If you see someone else has already asked that question, then don't repeat the question. We are joined today with our North Carolina Marshal at Arms, Cynthia Pinkston, and now I am proud to introduce you to Justice Anna Maria, who is joining us live from Big Lake, Alaska. Good morning. (laughs) Anchorage what? Oh, did I say Anchorage? Oh, you're in Anchorage. That's right. No, I'm I'm in Anchorage this morning. Um, Great. So... Where are we at this week, girls? What what burning topics do we have that uh, need to be addressed? Okay, everybody out there is going to freak out because, you know, I never bring this up, but I'm doing it today. Today, relief is the order of the day. Relief is order of the day today. We're going to talk about the banking. Mm-hmm. We're talking about it because Anna... You told us all kinds of really goodies, lots of little goodies last night. And today I want to start with, I have a question. So here's my question. I signed up as a vendor a long time ago, whenever they first explained that there was a vendor situation, because I've got the food church and I'm serving a lot of Americans here in the food church who would like to be able to, to, to use it, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to accept payment. Well, uh, that's kind of a technical banking question that I don't know. <laughs> I'm not into the technical end of it. Okay. Um, Who do I talk to or how do I, what do I do next? Because you said that we're ready for the vendors to join and I'm signed up, but I don't have any information. Well, see, as a vendor, it's, you have a vendor account. Yes. And your your client has a vendor account. Your your customer has a vendor, uh, not a vendor account, but an individual account. Correct. And you can transfer directly between the accounts. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, the, the InstaPay program is literally instant. It's a it's a transfer from one account to the other account. But then how do I use what I need from there to pay my outside vendors. You get your outside vendors to join as vendors. Oh, so I can't do it until and unless they're in a position to do that. Well, and, you know, the the question then becomes, how do we expand this? How do we uh, form essentially 
business incubators to expand the network. Mm -hmm. A lot of the big incorporated businesses don't have an unincorporated branch. Right. So they don't have a means of setting up immediately, don't have a means of setting up a, an account with our bank because they're not unincorporated, right? Right. And um, so how do we get through this? Well, one of the ways is that we can sponsor businesses that act as hubs where they may not have an unincorporated business, but another unincorporated business can operate as their um, receiver and transfer to them. To multiple. Can I say that one more time, that last part? Okay, so you could have an unincorporated business hub, an incubator, that acts as a receiver for, you know, the electric company um, or for the, um, uh, car uh, <laughs> rental or whatever, um, until, until they can get their own unincorporated branch going. But then this is the same moment where I'm at. So I have several farmers I work with. They would happily uh, be willing to receive payment in this way. Mm -hmm. However, there's other people that, well, some, well, anyway, some of them can do it. Some of them won't be able to do it right away or whatever. There may be in the process. Then there's people who I'm doing business with that are not going to do it. Like, for example, my landlord. Okay. Well, if they want, if they want, uh, if they want non-negotiable notes based on the good faith of Congress instead of gold, then, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, <laughs> I had one person say to me, Anna, I had one, one of my farmers who is a very well-respected, educated man that I know. He said, I, I can't really pay my taxes and everything with uh, gold. So I would prefer to receive payment. Um, you know, <laughs> this is what he's saying to me. He's like, I can't get my tire fixed and I can't, you know, pay for gas and I can't do this. So this is what I would prefer. And I was, and he also went further. He went further to say, uh, and also, you know, our government decides to just outlaw gold whenever they feel like it. And I'm thinking that is not our government, but right. Okay. I hear you. You don't believe me. <laughs> right. Well, so we go ahead and we, we, form our networks and, and we begin trade um, and we talk to our vendors and we get them to set up unincorporated um, business channels and then we can begin to trade anyhow. We, we don't wait for them. We don't care. You know, we're just going to go ahead and start trading. And, and essentially um, we have a direct trade between AFD and USD. Most people are not aware that there's an international currency and a domestic currency. The international currency, the USD, has always been asset backed. So when we trade with other countries, we always have to have asset backed currency. So the USD is, is asset backed already and it translates seamlessly into FRNs. So when you are trading AFD to USD, that's one step, and USD to FRN is another step, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So we can already go from AFD to USD, and that's where we're at right now is trading AFN to USD. USD then can be translated into Federal Reserve notes. So it's not actually that you can't get payment in Federal Reserve notes because USD is guaranteed in Federal Reserve notes. It's just another translation step. Right. So I would be able to easily be this hub for my community. And, you know, Anna, and, and here on North Carolina, um, in Pittsburgh, not far from me, they one time started their own currency. And they had started this whole thing mm -hmm. and they were already operating their whole town on this currency for their town. 
and they, I mean, they started it, that went a long way and, you know, then it got to some point, but you're limited the way that you're limited in, in a barter exchange, meaning like you're limited to who you can operate with and who you can do business with because it's a, you know, what is money anyway? It is a energy exchange, right? Well, okay. To an extent, but not really because USD, as I say, translates into FRNs. How do we get it from the USDs to the FRNs if that's what we need? That is a computer function, which is the next development. But we've got it to USDs. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, if we want to start our bartering or trading or businesses within our people, we can do that part. Get as many vendors together as you can. Right. Get as many people together as you can okay. and start, start using this as a mechanism by which you can trade. And once you have your trade established, then you can enter into uh, commerce on the land if you want to. You don't have to, but you can. Uh, really, it doesn't matter if you're trading in USD or FRNs. Uh, when when it goes into the system, the system doesn't realize or make any distinction between the two. The only difference is that one is an international currency and one is a domestic currency. Mm. So when you're spending domestically, it gets translated as FRN. And when you are trading internationally, it gets translated as USD. And so you can see that it's just one click away from, from total distribution. And that can happen pretty rapidly once we have the computer system geared up to be able to make that translation. And we have our little um, QRC code, um, our, um, what, what would you call it? It's a, a virtual credit card. Okay, mm -hmm. It's like on an app or something, right? Yeah, it's, it's it's a distribution system where instead of using a physical credit card, you would have your own individual QRC code attached to your account, which works as a virtual credit card for anybody who has a QRC reader for their store. And most stores already have a QRC code. Like right. if, you, if you go to Lowe's Hardware, for example, um, you know, I, I know one guy in Missouri who's going to be real, real happy because he can just go and he has this little QRC code attached to his global account and it will go into their their uh, QRC reader mm -hmm. and pay that account. So can I ask my merchant that I'm dealing with right now if they'll accept or they'll provide me with um, something to accept QR payments? No, you, you, you just ask them if they have a QRC reader in their system already that will accept payments. Because that'll allow me to receive those payments from our people. Right. Okay. Right. You, know, you just... Were, were you in, all right? Instead of the bar card, which is on everything, right? Uh huh. We're using the QRC code, which everybody's familiar with too, to a certain extent. Yeah, because like you know, like Starbucks and all these other guys have that. Right. So, I mean, it's it's being done already. So for all of you people out there doing business, and for me, Anna, this question is then. We can talk to our merchants currently and say, can we get a QRC reader for our accounts this red hot minute? Yeah, well, right. Do you have a QRC account and reader so that we can trans back, transact business using the QRC code? If they do, then you can begin this whole process of using your account as a, a virtual um, credit card, having your own little QRC code, your own QRC symbol, and you can just 
match that symbol to their, their symbol in their system, their account, and that's how it, it translates. That's how it meshes. So we're using the QRC instead of the barcode, which makes perfect sense because <laughs> the barcode is for, guess what? The bar. <laughs> yeah. It all, it all is too simple and also too crazy, right? Like it's just, right. ugh. Yeah. So, um, okay. so and we can talk to our, our merchant people until we're able to move forward to the next step. Right. Right. And, and get, get everybody to, you know, become familiar with the QRC system. Uh, get the, the, your vendors that, that you do business with. I mean, it's not so difficult to get a electric company to sign up for a QRC reader and account. I mean, that's just like another credit card, right? It's another way for them to get paid. Right. So, you know, if they um, sign up for a QRC reader account, uh, that then opens up their ability to do business with us. Yeah. And then, whoa, there you yeah. go. That's literally the only thing that was holding me back from doing anything is because I do have to pay some people like just like rent and electricity and, you know, well, you know, in time, everybody will have their QRC code. Right. Because everybody's wanting, everyone's going to want to be in on this, right? Right. And so, you know, your landlord, although they may right at the moment be going, what, what, what? You know? Well, <laughs> if I can accept payments using the QRC reader right now, then I can still go ahead and serve our Americans, you know, and I can also convert and I can still take care of what I need to unless and until I can get all my other people on board. And in the meantime, it gives me the opportunity to show them how I'm able to do this and how they could have this whole world of people as customers if they would just, you know, do this one simple thing. I just need to be the example so that yeah. they can see how it works because I've got several business owners here. In the food church, not all of them are Americans. Not some of them might never be because they're super Catholic. Some of them, you know, so whatever, it's fine. Everybody can be wherever they need to be. And at the same time, they're business owners. Um, hello, we just want to, ex you know, to operate in business with our, with everyone. Right, and you know, like I say, the QRC is is um, it's fairly well known. It's fairly familiar. And um, it's not a, a technology that's expensive to run. Okay. Um, and anything that, that they have to put out in terms of having a QRC reader um, and account system is paid back by the fact that our QRC system does not charge fees. Ah. So ah. It, it's when we say insta pay, we mean <laughs> There, there's no, there's no extra fee, no four per four percent transaction fee for the the vendor to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no bookkeeping on it for those kinds of things. It's just so. Follow up question then. So that system obviously isn't operating with the fraudulent IRS A. And right. B, right, okay, and then B. Um, that system is going to put merchants out of business because they shouldn't anyway be in the middle of us and the processor? Um, no, not necessarily. People still have credit cards. If they want to, you know, do that uh -huh. uh, again. But when you're dealing with a prepaid credit card, why would you? And then can people pay their credit cards off to get it over with? Yes. Yes. You know, okay. so Say that you've got a you QRC know. credit and that I would like to apply this QRC credit to my payment. How can I do that with your, with your, how can I pay my card off? Well, yeah, you know, okay. Here, here's this company that's working with the barcode system, right? You've got, you know, credit card ABC company that is issued a uh, Visa card, say. All right. Yep typical situation. Mm -hmm. 
So you want to pay off your visa card, right? Yes. Well, then you have credits in your prepaid credit account, right? Yes. So you ask the credit card company, do you have a QRC reader? And, you know, can you accept payments by QRC? And, and you say, this is another way in which you can receive payment. And they say, either yes or no. Either they already have this or they don't. Um, there's a, a, a company called Chime uh, that uses this system and is pretty well known in, in certain parts of the country already. Uh, so there are quite a few manufacturers and um, distributors of goods that use the QRC system already. So if they have it already, then it's, you know, easy, very easy to do. And if they don't have it and you just walk in and you say, hey, um, this is another way for you to get paid. <laughs> and, and it has these advantages. You know, there's there's no transaction fee, no no four percent charge back to the merchant, no no bookkeeping involved. It's just an instant payment where it's it's paid and it's done. Oh, and by the way, you can set up regular payments if you're a service provider. For example, yeah. um, you know, you've got someone. Well, Cynthia, like me, I, I provide some. I provide food every week to somebody. Oh my God. Well, you I know, food to somebody every week. And so if they want a standing order because they want to make sure that they're getting their beef, eggs, butter, bacon, whatever every week. And so right. we have them on a recurring billing. So you're saying that we can do that. Instant pay recurring billing. Quick. And you're saying that Chime is a uh, processor for this? Chime is is doing a um, a similar thing using the QRC system. They're already on a, a QRC payment system. But they are a processor. Well, they work like a credit card company, um, but they they are a they're using the QRC system. So a lot of the QRC um, vendors already have the technology set up so that you can just mesh with them because you would want to be able to take the chime card well yeah and, and since what i'm saying is we're not the only ones that are using the qrc code for payment sure no no hey, you just want to understand it i'm asking you all the questions that a business owner is going to want to know to try to figure out how they can step in or out or move around Right. Because we want them to be more be, be our vendors. But the business owner is going to say, how do I do this and how do I get the money so that I can do what I need to do? Because some people are going to take, you know, the federal there. Some of some people just want to use FRNs because they just whatever, you know. Got one for you. It says if someone would be able to, to, to do an outgoing transfer out of the GFG into our current credit union account and pay those until we get more participation. Would that be a good thing to do? Just take the, the. Your credit union would have to get a QRC system. There you go. Thank you. But, you know, like I say, that's no big deal. It's like getting a, a credit card reader. You know, and so we'll be using the QRC system instead of the barcode and we'll be doing it as a, an instant payment um, process instead of charging the vendors a 4% service fee on every transaction and creating all that extra expense and extra bookkeeping for everybody. We'll just be absorbing that cost and um, that makes it easy for the vendor. It makes it easy for the person who is uh, doing the transaction. Um, it, it just er, it, it eradicates an awful lot of expense and, and irritation for everybody concerned. And since you are the lucky beneficiaries of P, a prepaid credit, right? This is, this is already um, money on account, not money of account. And, and I, I keep trying to make this distinction clear for people. 
Um, Federal Reserve notes are credit notes. They are debt notes. They they work on on a system as IOUs. So what are you doing when you are accruing more Federal Reserve notes? You're actually accruing more of other people's debt. And isn't that offensive? And you know these are also non-negotiable instruments. They're actually, they're worthless, literally, because they're an IOU, but they don't stipulate when they're going to be paid back, and they don't stipulate in what form are they going to be paid back. So, you know, um, would you take an, an IOU that just said IOU and uh, John Doe, which is essentially what a, a Federal Reserve note is, um, and it doesn't say anything about how it's going to be paid or when. That it's means open it, contract. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's just it can be interpreted however they can say, oh, you know, here's a pile, here's a bag of dirt. You're paid back now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and we have no we have no recourse from that because we accepted this debt note without knowing how we were going to be repaid. Maybe they're going to repay us by killing us, you know. Maybe they're going to repay us by uh, uh, injecting us with crap and claiming to own us. Maybe they're going to repay us by, you know, people need to to be uh, kind of get more savvy about the realm of trade and commerce because remember D'Artagnan and the three musketeers and the kinds of insults they would hurl back and forth among each other, you know, and, and I will slice off your head and I will rip out your guts and I will offer to, you know, <laughs> you know, carve you a new one. <laughs> it's it's kind of like that. These, these people make these outrageous offers. And if you, um, when will virtual cards be available? Everybody wants to get started. When is that virtual card going to be available? Well, they're working on that right now, but they're starting with the vendors so that the card will have places to go. Get busy, Nephi, getting that stuff done. Will the American Federation dollar to American Federation note transaction be facilitated by digital currencies? No, we don't need digital currencies to make that transaction happen. Um, people that want digital currencies, and I don't recommend them, but you know, uh, there's a, a, a trade going on in digital currencies between um, coins like Bitcoin and all that. Um, we have a Harmony coin, which is available worldwide. And if, if you want to trade in Harmony coins with Bitcoin and all the other kinds of digital currencies, you can. Uh, but that's a whole separate realm. And it, it requires different transactions, different computers, different, you know, different wallets, virtual wallets, all this different kind of stuff. Um, I don't get into it, but... You know, it's like the FRNs. If you want to trade in FRNs, uh, it's legal tender in this country. Next question says, Anna, can you explain the Basel tiers, as in Basel three, Basel four, Basel five, which you talked about? Well, that's just um, there's some there there there's successive um, rules and changes in banking regulation is what they are. And um, they, they set these new regulations and standards uh, that are for all of the central banks, right? And then it's a matter of coming into compliance with the new standards. So when we're talking about being Basel III compliant, what, what we're saying is, okay, well, now this bank is compliant with these new regulations that were established as Basel III, right? 
And what we found is that um, although these standards are supposed to improve uh, connectivity and, um, you know, to increase the, um, the, the function of the banks and their interactivity and, and to cut down on other kinds of regulation and have other advantages, uh, some banks, especially our banks, have dragged their feet so that, um, you know, all of the banks were supposed to be compliant with Basel III, I think, 10 years ago. And our banks are still just kind of clunking along. And it hasn't been until recently that they've actually had to shut down some banks because they weren't Basel III compliant. Okay. Our bank is already for, you know, is already compliant with Basel IV. So our bank is already past all that. Says next question. What is what is the prosecution have to do with performance and the bid bonds? What then? Oh, what what if the prosecution has the performance and bid bonds? Well, of course they have the performance and bid bonds. They have to bid on the case to begin with, and then they have to guarantee their performance on the case. So of course the prosecutors have the performance and bid bonds. In fact. The, the whole name of that game is when you're in a, a uh, this is federal court, right? Um, the whole name of that game is to exhaust your remedies and then seize upon their performance and bid bonds. And at that point, then they have to come back and pay you directly. They have to have their little checkbook there or the case gets dismissed. Vegas, baby. That's a Vegas show. So Dennis wants to know, in your article 4669, Stolen Russian Assets, is the number 10 billion with a B metric tons of gold that belongs to Russia? Is that what you said correct? Is that is that right? Yes. We've been lied to about how many tons of gold have been mined. When all this silliness started, um, there was a famous line from uh, one of the British lords who was sitting on the banking for parliament, right? Um, he, who came out and said, well, everyone knows only 1,500 tons of gold have ever been mined in the history of the world. And I'm sitting there going, this is the banking committee for parliament? And they believe that? You know, <laughs> it was... Because I have I have records and I have have stuff at my disposal that tells me just how mammoth the amount of gold that's been extracted from the earth really is, and so the lies of immorality just never stop. It's just right. never ending. And they they lie to the Parliament and to the Congress just as they lie to us. Jeff Jackson wants to know, hey Anna, what? does the Ohio Assembly need to, to give you for review, like a punch list? Um, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I guess I'm, they want to be seated, Anna. Well, there's nothing to be seated if you've gone through the training and you're ready to move on, then do so. I mean, it's... <laughs> Look, coordinators step up, and I, I'm assuming this is about coordinators. Uh, if not, they want they want to see Ohio. They think they have their four pillars up. Well, then yes, and they'd have to they'd have to prove that. How do they're asking you what to what do they need to give you? Well, they have to show me performance. They have to show me that yeah, they've got a reasonable number of people engaged, that they have their court system set up, that they know what they're doing, and that they can provide court services to the people of Ohio, that they have their militia set up, and that they can provide militia services to the people of Ohio. The first responder militia services, right? And they have the, they also have the uh, International Business Assembly set up and, and ready to function. That's a lot of learning and a lot of positions and a lot of a lot of service functions to fulfill. And if they think they're ready, well, go ahead and, and we'll give them the, the once over and see if they are. I think they want to know, how do they tell you? Well, you just tell me. 
Just tell him, Jeff. Just tell her. It's fine. Monica, does General Assembly moderator not speak need to be an ASC? No. Okay, no. Okay. Yeah. If yeah. your credit card company has a QRC reader system, yes. But you may have to go to your credit card company and say, hey, time for you to get a QRC reader system. Common law trust for a co-op committee uh, community. Any suggestion? Um, common law trusts have been used for hundreds of years, and they're very effective. Um, some of the common law trusts that Benjamin Franklin set up are still in operation. Um, there are individual common law trusts, and there are community or business common law trusts that you can set up. And so what you're talking about is a, a common law um, business trust situation. You would not want a co-op per se. You would want a common law business trust taking over from a co-op because a co-op is a, a, a Roman, uh, it's under the other system, right? Okay, so you would want to set up your business trust in the form of co-op or, or with an agreement um, that carried forward the ideals and, and mission uh, for your members. Um, there's a, a very good book about uh, common law business trusts, and I'm having a hard time remembering it, but I think it's just called the Uncorporation. Um, so you're, you're basically using a trust, um, a business trust, to do the functions of an incorporated entity without being an incorporated entity. Let me do a secondary question to that. If one has a business that's incorporated and they want to go unincorporated and then uh, they want to move back to the land and the soil, then what about the trademarks, the patents to be moved to the land and the soil? Also, websites and jurisdictions. Well, you would just you would take the all of the you take all of the assets of the incorporated entity and donate them to your new um, you know your business trust. And basically, a business trust can operate just like any individual trust, but it can operate as businesses, unincorporated businesses. We were just talking about this this morning. Um, the United States was in possession of all of its um, international and, and global commercial powers. Uh, early on at the beginning of all this in 1776 it had all of these powers and all these responsibilities and it said to itself this is too much <laughs> we we need to to split this up a bit and divide and conquer the the complexity of it uh, so we're going to keep all the domestic business here we're going to manage our own domestic business but we're going to form a holding company, which is a, a common law business trust. And we're going to call it the United States of America. And we're going to give the United States of America responsibility for all the international and, and commercial business. Okay. So there you have a, a great example of a common law business trust where a specific asset um, their, their rights and interests and in international and global uh, commercial transactions and, and negotiations and all that stuff was the asset that the United States donated to the United States of America holding company, right? So the United States of America is acting as their trustee for the benefit of the progeny, right? So this is something that you can do too. Um, for example, say that I have a small business, XYZ manufacturing widgets, okay? Um, 
I can donate the access, the assets of XYZ to a new name, uh, common law business trust, right? I can, I can uh, donate that to uh, ABC business trust and the business trust can be another business. It can be another business that's in the business of, of acting as trustee for other businesses. Ah, another question. To pay the mortgage, can we do a wire transfer out of the GFG? No, we're still working on getting a wire tra uh, transfer connectivity because the other banks are trying to stonewall us. They're trying to say that uh, maritime com commerce doesn't uh, connect to land commerce, which is ridiculous. It, commerce is commerce. Where, wherever it's coming from into the air, so to speak, uh, it, it really doesn't matter and has never traditionally mattered, but they're still raising this red herring and trying to, you know, slow us down. All right, another question. Where do we get the QR code to scan to give to a vendor? That is part of the, we'll be getting your own QR code as part of your virtual credit card. That is essentially what your, your virtual credit card is, is your own individual singular QR code that connects to your GFG account. Thank you. I guess they're trying to know, um, you're saying that we can use that with vendors. So can we do that now? And where do we get that? Do we just find, I mean, I don't know. Is there more information coming? Yeah, well, there'll be assignment of a QR code to your account. That'll be your your thing, your, your own personal individual right. out of the entire world. That yeah. will be you, your QR code. Is it what we're going to find on our app already right now? That's the question. Like, is it there? Because. No, it's not there yet. It is. It has not been assigned yet. Got it. This is what we're confused about, Anna. Sorry. So the reason we're confused is because we're, you're saying we can get vendors together and we can start operating together. And if we're going to start operating together, you're saying the only way to do that this red hot minute is to do the transfer between the accounts internally, not the scanning. So there's just a little confusion there. Right, right. We don't have the scanning portion of this together yet. Not everybody has a QR scanner in their system yet. Right. Okay. So even if I get the scanner, like first I'm going to find out, can I get the scanner? I'm going to ask everybody I need to, t t as, a, as a vendor, I'm going to ask my people to see, can I get this QRC system because they should want me and everybody else to have it. And I'll, that's cool. So then once I get that in the, in the, in between now and then, hopefully we'll be able to get these. Uh, and in the meantime, because I'm a vendor already, if an American already wants to go ahead and pay me for it through using that system, I could just do a direct payment through, like we can set it up for Instapay. Right. Got it. Right. And right. The, the QRC, mm -hmm. once you have your QRC code, it'll be just like the, the chip on your credit card, only it'll be a QRC code. Right. And on, our, on our app, right? On our phone app. Well, I'm I'm pretty I'm assuming it's going to be on a phone app too, but you'll have a card. Oh, so I think that's the other question is like, are, so we're still waiting on a card that's that's going to have this. QR. You're not having to wait. You'll you'll have your QR code right okay. as a virtual credit card. You'll be able to scan that into the QR reader at the vendor. Yes. Assuming they have a QR code reader. reader. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that will allow you to do an instant transfer. Right. Okay. So that QR code is the only thing that you, and the vendor having the QR code reader is the only thing that you really have to worry about. Right. Okay. This red hot minute, GFG hasn't given us the codes. All right, friends. We're just able to do an inside internal transfer currently. Yeah. We're, we're starting that process of the internal transfer loop okay got it and and but this is we're going forward with our our system we're not waiting for right uh, 
the Federal Reserve to roll over and, and uh, you know, wiggle its dying legs. Um, um, I don't think Anna ever waits for permission. That's what I know. I don't know that I don't know where Anna's waiting on permission. Cynthia, go ahead. Secondary question. Can a common law business trust be the same name minus the incorporated to preserve a built brand? And is there a proper donation paperwork process for the publishing or do you just publish it on the LRO? Um, say the problem with just doing things that way is that um, there are, because your, your corporation doesn't really belong to you, <laughs> you have to transfer your assets into the unincorporated business over a period of time and establish your unincorporated business side. And then you can create a business trust and operate it through a trustee relationship. Um, but you have to play their game, their their rules, right up until you leave their system. Shirley wants to know, uh, Anna, what about buying a car or a house? That is a whole different system. Um, you've got, um, you know, like presently, presently we have a, a loan system. We get a car loan. We get a house loan. Uh, and we go through all that turkey trot and we wind up spending, you know, four or five times more than the cost of the thing that we're buying because they're paying out interest on it, right? Well, we don't have that because when when we buy a car or a house, we just buy it. Now, you're going to have enough on your on your accounts. So yeah, yeah, you can just walk in and buy a car or a house if the vendor accepts QRC payments. Okay. Um, if they don't, if if they're into the real estate thing and they uh, don't quite know how to handle a non-loan situation. Uh, there's going to have to be a, a process by which we can set up an escrow account and then do it through escrow. But that's another service of the bank. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a, a separate department within the bank that is currently under construction for specific large purchases. Anna, you had said once before about keeping the economy stable. You were worried about a flood of money, a flood of whatever. I just got a text from somebody that says, I'll take my money out of the global family and give it to you for such and such cash. This is not a smart move in any way because this is 180 gold went up. So I'd say it's a, a larger amount that the value is, and we should, I wrote two notes down here, we should probably start doing some kind of uh, money teaching in our assemblies for people who haven't had money so they understand that this is not just a dollar for a dollar, this is a dollar for a hundred, uh, for more money, and that we don't want to just piss it away, give it away, or whatever, that it needs to be for a value worth something. I yield. Well, yeah, that would be really stupid. <laughs> you know, um, each AFD is worth 180 FRNs. Why would you give away your AFD? I don't know. The, I think in the beginning when people saw this 5,000 that was put in, they 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 were so They're desperate. So desperate that there's desperation and that they want to try and do something. And we've got people losing houses. You talked last night about Terry Song losing her house. And I thought we got people losing houses, people in jail, kids. Well, you know? to tell you the truth, Cynthia, if we had known what we now know, Terry would have never even been in that court. Okay. Um, if we had known what we now know, there would never have been a mortgage 
there would never have been an allegation of debt. We would have just shut them down from the get-go. As I said, the best time to nip it in the bud is before they get their hooks in you. That's true. They're dirty. They're, you've said over and over, fraud, fraud, fraud. So we don't expect anything any different. Whatever they're saying, we don't believe it. We want to look the other way. But I, I felt sorry for her last night because she's had a hard time when she was settled. And, you know, I thought, you know, one day all of this is going to turn. And when it does, and people are just in a, a bad place right now, trying to make groceries. Yeah, well, I know that. But in this past week, for anybody that has a money claim against them, who has done their declaration and witness and, and gotten, you know, made their declaration and, and proved up as an American, I have given you the, the ultimate weapons to deny any debt based on the use of Federal Reserve notes. Any debt, property taxes, income taxes, mortgages, credit cards, anything, anything at all yeah. in the Federal Reserve notes, I have given you the silver bullet mm -hmm. to absolutely deny any of those debts and leave them all going. Right. I think that the only what we're talking about, the people that are losing their homes now are the ones that are renting. <laughs> Still, the ones that are renting, they're the ones because they're the ones who are being evicted or whatever if they're renting. So if they owned it or they tried to buy, you know, if look, if you needed, if you a mortgage. yeah, for the mortgage, you can write the mortgage off. You can, you've given everybody the silver bullet to be able to uh, reconcile their mm -hmm. mortgage. And if they don't understand that, that's different. But when you're a renter, uh, you're kind of in limbo. These are the people that we're trying to ask questions for. It's not the homeowners. And if, if, if someone out there isn't really understanding that, then, you know, you can bring that to our Friday conversation when we're live after five um, for the podcast on Telegram. Well, rent, rent is a, is more like a vendor issue. Yes. Yeah. That's where so we could encourage the vendor <laughs> We could try to encourage the vendor or we could ask the vendor, like some of these people right now, have you asked your vendor if they have a QRC system? I wonder, I wonder if they have one. You never know. A lot of these real estate companies would really benefit themselves mm -hmm. uh, to get a QRC system, just like having a credit card system. If they take credit card payments, then they should take QRC payments. Mm -hmm. And most of these gas stations have that scanner thing where you can put a, a I mean, just about everywhere for gas, you can do that. So it seems like, you know, so. Um, it's spreading. The, the QRC system is spreading and, it, and it's very popular. Um, right. And it's, um, it's more secure in a lot of ways than the barcode system. Yes. So, um this person wants to know, can you, with a digital wallet, does that give you access to Federation banking system? I don't think so. No, no. You you have an option where you can uh, buy into the Harmony coin, which is a, a digital coin that Global offers. And that has its own wallet. And it can be traded for other things like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But we're not really into Bitcoin. You know, we what we want is an actual currency, mm -hmm. a paper currency, ultimately. This is just a, a transition. This is a, a credit and a prepaid credit system that's being introduced to give people relief. But ultimately, we'll have our own certificate. Um, you know, there'll be actual cash that you hold in your hand and have complete control of. So people are wanting to know, do you have any idea what the lead time is for people for us to receive QRC codes? I haven't been talking to the bankers about that this week, so I don't know the answer. Okay. Maybe next week you'll tell us. Well, I have questions for them too. Sure. Um, no, Tam, we don't deal with the IRS. 
And the IRS can't touch our bank. Because did you hear what Anna said last night? You should listen to that. Yeah. The, I, it's okay, Anna. Well, the IRS thing, you know, it, it just, people are so bamboozled. Uh, <laughs> Johnny's just wanting you to know, even the Cash App has a QR code. Look at that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody's uh, going to the QR code. So, you know. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the, the next thing, and we're already there. We're working on, okay, LV, we already talked about this. Let's see here. I don't believe that the QR code could be manufactured. If I took me a little marker and I was marking it out, it's got these dots and these blocks, and I don't think there's anything that could read that because there's no indication of what it is. It's just a box with information, and when you've got it, it does it, and it knows everything, your account, your information. You don't have to tell anybody anything. It just right. does that one thing, and it takes it. Right, and it's totally unique. Each one is totally unique, and it's it's far more secure than a barcode. Um, can we send, can can people send funds to GFG from GFG to GFG? That yes, this is what you're saying. So yeah. yes, internally we can do it so that we can um, cash it out for each other. Right. So if I owe Neethi or Neethi owes me something, we can, tr we can trade freely. Um, the, the external thing, the QR code system will allow us to trade externally. And the, um, the process of, of putting that together is underway right now. We're, we're steaming on it. Um, so I'm just explaining to you that instead of using a barcode card, we'll be using a QR card or, you know, a image of the QR code that's attached to our account. Mm. You're so advanced, Anna. We're just trying to keep up, girl. We're just trying to keep up with you. Okay. Uh, okay. So Gen Genevieve saying uh, on Oregon, if we don't have a proper meets and bounds survey for our property, is the best way to defend our land ownership the testimony you recently posted? No, no, that's not a meets and bounds is not hard to do. If you, you walk if, it, right? I mean, we can walk it and do it the old fashioned way, right, Anna? Yeah, well, just, you know, buy yourself a hundred foot tape measure and, you know, locate the corners. You already know where the corners of your property are, most likely. Right. Um, so basically, a meets and bounds uh, survey is just you go out there, you look around, uh, you pound found a stake in the ground or a monument marker or, you know, you use a big pile of rocks, <laughs> you, know, you know, my property goes from this particular described monument marker, you know, a, a bronze uh, stake uh, with a uh, round knob on the top of it, uh, 300 feet to the next boundary marker, you know, you, you just make it a physical description. The important part of a meets and bounds survey is the physical pers um, um, description. And you can even go on, there's apps that you can get on your phone that will show you your your property markers, the, the corners and of your property by GPS. They'll tell you exactly where it is. So that you can go out there and just pound in your monument marker, your stake, your landmark, right? And and locate the exact position within like six inches of, of exactly where your corner is. And you mark you mark your property that way and describe it, you know, from this property marker to that property marker, and you, you make the whole circuit that way. And that's a means and bounds survey. And you, you know, just use a, a hundred foot tape measure to, you know, measure out between those those uh, corners. And if you've got an irregularly shaped piece, it doesn't matter because it will, the GPS locator will automatically match up that property description with those coordinates. 
Zelle. QRC is used by most banks and credit union. Yeah, it's already there. My oh. bank uses Zelle, Anna. Yes. Yes. So the, so the Zelle QRC will. Thanks, Nicole, on San Bernardino County. Oh my yes, God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. There's, so you see. Yeah. And I said, a, see, I told you it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new thing. It's the up and coming thing. It's it's the hey, thing. Lena, thing. Anna is keeping us fresh, y'all. We are we are fresh. Because look at that. Okay. Phyllis, how do you determine the AFD price? Okay. You told us the AFD price. The the AFD, like all gold backed or silver backed currencies, value goes up and down. And it's posted every day as an exchange rate value. So, you know, every day. Um, the market value of, of uh, U.S. silver dollars goes up and down. Um, and that's a, a computer program that's built in um, that when you transfer from one currency to another, uh, mm -hmm. it'll be different on different days. And that's something that Americans have to get used to because in the FRN system, you didn't have to deal with that. But we've computerized it so that it's, you know, basically up to the second. Um, and it, it'll require you to, to think in things in terms of, of exchange rates more. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. We'll get used to that. Okay, so once we have our QR code, then we can use Cash App to pay bills. Yeah, you could use Cash App. You could use Chime. Um, any any vendor that has the QRC code would then be able to connect to our system. Says, so when will we get access to the GFG, and can we visit our label, our labor, and our awful money, and convert our FRNs for now? Um, there is the, the vault and the safety vault is a means by which you can capture, store, and benefit from, um, the federal reserve notes, uh, just to give you an actual uh, projection, the Federal Reserve note will be actually less than a penny in value. So here you are standing here with all these Federal Reserve notes and, and your $100 bill is now worth a dollar. Okay. So there, there's, it's, it's when, when this whole thing goes kablooey, and I don't see how it's going to avoid going kablooey. Um, you know, there may be some save that's possible, but I don't know what it is at this moment. Um, all those FRNs that you're holding in your hand will be worth virtually nothing. Um, so the question is, how do you preserve the value of your FRN money um, and, and salt it away? Well, you... You can put FRNs in the vault. And what that does is it guarantees you the value of your FRNs today will be honored in AFD tomorrow. And that's a huge thing. That's, that's a huge possible gain in value for you um, as sort of a payback for what the FRNs did to you so um, that's so kind of a good situation. So everybody who's got uh, $10,000 stuck in their mattress, you know, in the old days, that's what they did. All they right. The wall and then the mattress. It's going to benefit you to get it in the vault. And if not, you should transfer it into silver or gold. Then at least it's going to hold some value. Right. Time, until this transition happens. Safe. Right. And, and believe me, we're trying to 
So we're trying to save the, um, the value that you have vested in the Federal Reserve notes. You know, the idea is to lock down, as of today, uh, Niti has um, 10,000 Federal Reserve notes. She puts them in the vault. Um, the disaster happens. Okay, the conversion happens. So now she's got hundred the equivalent of 180 Federal Reserve notes represented by a single AFN. Okay, but she's got the same number of FN, AFNs as she put into the vault as FRNs. It's almost a... Uh, it, it's a restitution plan in a way because, you know, you take your 10,000 FRNs, you put them in the vault, the disaster happens, you get 180 AFD or you get 10,000 AFD. Whatever you put in as FRNs, you get paid back as AFD. And each AFD is, worth, is currently worth 180 FRNs. So if you're having a problem thinking, people, if you'll take that money that's not going to be worth much, when the stock market fell back in the 1930s, there were people that were in disasters. Take and do something now. If you have the spare, get it out of your mattress and go turn it into something. Because if you're sitting there, Anna's just told you what a value of a $100 bill is going to be, and you may have a whole stack of them. And when it happens... They ain't going to be worth a loaf of bread. Yeah, unfortunately. And, and we're trying to prevent that. But, you know, at, at the present moment, it doesn't look very favorable. Anna, how will the minting of paper and coin be handled without it being attacked for counterfeiting? Oh, well, there will always be counterfeiters. But the thing is that unless you have actual coinage and you have actual certificate money, um, the control of it gets away from the individual. And that would be extremely dangerous because then they could politicize your ability to transact. And um, cash is what keeps you free. <laughs> cash is what, what makes it possible for you to um, determine your own way in life. And so, yes, we have to have coinage and we have to have cash. And if they counterfeit it, well, then we'll have to catch the counterfeiters and shut it down. But um, it's worth it. It's worth it because we need the cash to preserve our freedom. PayPal uses QR code. Yay. Okay, so... Okay, so Phyllis wants to know, are we able to transfer to Cash App or Zelle now? No, not yet. Don't have our individual QR codes yet. But that's what we're talking about when we're talking about. Um, <laughs> that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a virtual credit card. Yeah. Hey, you guys, you're going to hear it first here <laughs> when you can. So Leonard's being funny. We know Leonard. He's like, okay, give me my QRC code. So, okay. Don't ask me every single week. You know that I'm going to say, hello, do you think Anna doesn't want to tell you the big news? Because we are going to release the big news here as soon as it's out there. I'm, we're going to let you know because I, I bet you Anna won't be able to sleep. She's going to be so excited to tell you because Nobody's trying to keep this a secret, right, Anna? I mean, Anna is just bursting. <laughs> yeah, we've been working on this since 2007. Yes. I mean, think about it. Ten years at 2017. Right. Yep. Okay. And people can still move money into the vault via the, that app, the... the Get the link tree for, uh, so the link tree for uh, GFG is going to be in the show notes on our link tree. 
So just go to the GFG link tree. It tells you how to do all these things that y'all are asking us about. There's a bunch of questions. Those answers are on the GFG link tree, which is on the link tree for the show notes here. Okay. So please go there and you'll be able to see that. And this person, Nicole, what should under 50 people do with their 401k, 401k and brokerage accounts? I, we rolled ours over into gold. What, what do you have to say, Anna? Right. Well, uh, you can roll it over into gold or silver. Uh, I would go with silver myself at this point because okay. silver traditionally uh, in a free market uh, is it uh, is worth 65% of gold. And so you can see that at it, the present uh, rigged market, uh, you know, silver is selling for around $20 an ounce and gold is um, selling for around 2000 an ounce. Um, so could, could gold sell, sell for more? It could, but only if it's rigged, because there's so much gold that's been mined in the world that it really isn't that rare. Mm. Um, okay. But silver is rare uh, in comparison, and silver has more uses than gold in industry. Mm. So it's actually more valuable as a commodity um, when, you, when you look at it that way. The, the thing about silver is that it's been suppressed by very ruthless um, commodity rigging. Mm -hmm. And so when the market is free, um, silver will, will always tend to be 65% of the value of gold. So you're looking at a potential gain of, you know, from $20 to 1500 say, per ounce. Mm-hmm. So the, the smart move, if you're going to make a deposit. Uh, so then you wouldn't want to put your silver certificates in the vault. They should just hold on to those, huh? Yeah, I would just hold on to my silver certificates. And um, the, you know, as far as the vault goes, um, the, the vault is really set up as a restitution mechanism so that you get back the loss that you suffered on your money from 1913 to today. You see, there's, there's been this cyclical eating away the value of your money. Leonard says, I think that guy was wanting to say that the U.S. government, how, it, how will the U.S. government come for us after, uh, come after us for counterfeiting? They can't. They so, can't. Yep. They can't. Blessings. Anna, you just did a fantastic job. Look, we even hit the bank and everything. And we just, we talked about all the hard things. Everybody is going to, so I just wanted to say to David here that we were going to tell you about the QR codes because the, you, the QR codes will probably come before you get the card in the mail. Right. The, the first thing will be a virtual card. It'll be, you know, you get your code and you can then use it um but then a card ultimately you'll have a card mm -hmm. and ultimately you'll have cash well, I'm gonna use and I, thank you i'm gonna okay. use my debt notes and i'm gonna save that gold american federation dollars and i'm gonna get rid of the stuff that i've got yeah. just you know and i'm, I'm gonna keep Whoa! If you can afford to do that. Do that. You you popped off, girl. Oh well. Billy, you're gonna see the link tree in the show notes at the end of the show. So, you know, study up on all this stuff. Think about it. Think about what money is. Think about what money isn't. Think about Federal Reserve notes. Think about USD. Think about um, the AFD that we've established. And no, really. I think there's so much fear out there because the the these corporations have latched on to, to people and made examples of them, like the January 6th protesters, and they're trying to latch on to Donald Trump and make an example of him. And, you know, they're, they're doing all these evil things. Um, be aware mm -hmm. that that once you really learn your stuff, and you learn who you are, and you're able to defend who you are, 
they don't have a word to say to you. They have no right to even address you. Nope. And let's be very clear, Anna. Every time we mention the January Sixers, we talk about the Colorado Nine or any of these other people. I keep telling everybody uh, they weren't papered up, A. B, the January Sixers walked into, they walked into and outside of their jurisdiction and into the wrong jurisdiction. There's a lot of bits and bots going on here. And it's all because people are uneducated. And I, I'm going to put this one person's question up here because this person is offensive. But let's just answer it once and for all because you know how you know how you do, Anna. You know how you say. Anna says you could just look up her skirt till you find Jesus. Okay, friend. So we're just going to go ahead and squash this guy. I want you to answer this person once and for all because I get this question 10 million times and it's ridiculous. Well, right now he's in a hospital. So there. So, you know, and he's not feeling all that well. He's, he's uh, physically, he's able to walk a couple miles a day. So he's, he's not that bad. But on the other hand, he suffers from, uh, you know, various other maladies and problems that need to be resolved before he's really going to be comfortable in front of a camera and be able to sit here like me and talk to you. Um, now, right now, we've got several different health issues and several different drug interaction issues that we're trying to solve for Jim. And in fact, that's my mission after I leave here is to go to the hospital and have it out with the hospital administrators who are trying to give him Seroquel. And I'm just going to put this out here for everybody, um, especially smokers, especially people who have smoked all their lives. Uh, I, I will share a personal uh, journey with you. Uh, Jim was typical of his uh, generation gr growing up in Ketchikan, Alaska. Uh, he got hooked on cigarettes when he was young, and he continued to smoke until he was about 60 years old, at which point he switched over to a, um, a pure nicotine uh, substitute type um, system uh, with the e-cig. Okay, so he used an electronic cigarette um, to get his nicotine hit. And um, so he had a significant cigarette um, addiction but it was quite a few years ago that he tapered off of all of that and, you know, would only take an occasional hit on an e-cigarette. So he had brought that down, way down. Nonetheless, um, he has a um, an established pattern with this ACT receptor. Now, this is interesting. You've got acetylcholine, which is a primary nerve uh, transfer molecule in your body, which is absolutely essential to your existence. And it attaches to a little receptor on your cell. That receptor is the same exact receptor as the spike protein and nicotine and cannabis. So what Seroquel, the drug, does is it comes in and it blocks that receptor. And it creates a feedback loop to your body saying, oh, well, we've already got all the acetylcholine receptors blocked up and, and in use. Well, that's a problem because when your body stops producing choline, it begins to eat away your brain. It creates essentially a soft lobotomy. Spike protein, nicotine, Seroquel, and of the of the things that you could you could take that would not block the production of choline, but which would fill up that receptor. Cannabis and nicotine are actually not addictive. 
we've been told nicotine is addictive. Nicotine is addictive. No, it's not. It's also in a lot of plants. It's not just in cigarettes. Yeah, it's it, nicotine is in um, tomatoes. Yes. Uh, bell peppers, eggplants, cauliflower. All, all the nightshades. Tomatoes, you know, and we're not addicted to those, are we? So um, it, it's not addictive. We've been lied to by the FDA and not for, by the first, <laughs> this isn't the first time, okay? But all that, that uh, programming that you've got with those labels, nicotine is addictive, it's not. Uh, and technically it's not even classed as a drug, it's classed as a nutrient. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, of the things that, you, that uh, will give you that calming effect, that uh, they they give this to people in hospitals to calm them down and for anti-anxiety. And they're trying to give this to Jim, which would basically, um, over time, would lobotomize him. It would hasten uh, any dementia and, and create dementia um, symptoms. So... Um, we are battling the hospital over giving him Seroquel. But this is something for everybody to know because Seroquel is, it says right on the label, not for patients over 65. But these hospitals and nursing homes are giving Seroquel to their patients to calm them down and, um, you know, for anti-anxiety. And nicotine is a far better choice strangely enough. So anyway, um, if you want the anti-anxiety effects of, of cannabis and um, cigarette smoking, then what you do is you give them a nicotine patch instead. You, you don't give them Seroquel, which will interrupt the uh, production and, and availability of choline, which is a basic building block of your brain. Wow, money, medicine, uh, government. What else do you know, Anna? She knows how to identify lies and immorality. And they've been lying for the longest time. Everything it, they say is a lie. Well, and you have to watch. You have to watch this stuff. I mean, um, you know, if I hadn't looked into Seroquel, if I hadn't, you know, specifically said, well, what kind of drugs are you giving my husband? Right. And they then had to produce the list. And then I had to do my homework. And I had to look at that and go, holy crap, it says right there, not for patients over 65. He's 81. Why are they giving him this? You know, you would think that a doctor would look at that and go, not for patients over 65. Well, I better find something else for anti-anxiety. <laughs> For my senior patients, this is a 67 bed facility that uh, it's a, a rehab facility. It has um, it, one of its primary goals is, is for people that have amputations, you know, for, you know, accidents, um, diabetes, you know. So their primary one of their primary uh clientele is, is people that are recovering from amputations, but they also get an awful lot of retirees and, and elders. And so they have a lot of patients who are over 65 who are there recovering from surgeries and whatnot. And they're giving them Seroquel. If you have someone in a nursing home or in a rehabilitation hospital, um, Auntie Meg is agreeing with you. That's all. Yes. Well, and so the, the problem with, with those blocking those receptors is that it tells your body to stop producing choline. Mm -hmm. And you need the choline to prevent dementia. And but, so they're actually giving a drug to senior citizens that is not for senior citizens because it basically eats your brain. 
They just want to kill all the old people who have the answers, who have lived long enough to know the lies from the truth. No, they're but, ignorant. Well, it's they all of these things. They don't have any healing going on, Anna. We know that because they're they're paid and created and everything by the Rockefellers. How can we expect them to actually be trying to heal us? Well, and it's it's even more insidious than that. It, it, the drug companies come right out and say, not for patients over 65. It right. couldn't be more clear. It's right there. Everything but, they say is for not the people. I mean, when you go into the hospital, like I was there with my daughter, right? Like every day I had to sign paper. Like Cynthia's in the hospital with her husband right now. They All they do is make you sign releases all day long that they're not responsible for anything. Because they... They, there's no healing going on there, friends. But look, Anna, like you had suggested, we need healing centers. That's what yeah. we're working on. We know right. we know what needs to happen. We know what we're working on it. Right. I mean, we're going as fast as we can. Right. Right. I mean, I don't know, Anna. Can you go faster? <laughs> can you go faster? So, like, we're going as fast as we can. And even in this. Look, everything we do, we're so vested in it. We never finish on the hour. You never just run away from us. We're way over time. This is how much we care. Well, we just I just wanted to get that out there. Check on, on anybody you know who's in a nursing home. If they're giving them Seroquel, say no Seroquel. Uh, if they're you know, if they're anxious and having problems and they're in a state where uh, cannabis is legal, give them cannabis. If they're in a state, any state where um, nicotine is available as nicotine patches, give them the nicotine patches. And that will calm them down without damaging them and without messing with their choline um, production. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, everybody, for showing up today and joining us and joining us every week. And we're going to be back next Tuesday. God help us. With more. We'll be back. We love you.